Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah Thompson, and I'm one of four regional outreach specialists here at the University of Wisconsin Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention, also known as UWC Tree. Um, we're really excited for our guest presenter that we have with us today because they are internal to UWC Tree and have done a lot of work um, understanding the cost effectiveness of treating tobacco use and dependence. Um, before I turn it over to our presenter and get into the presentation, I do have a few remarks reminders and housekeeping items for you. Um, first of all, just to prevent any bandwidth issues, um, we have a lot of people joining us today, so we ask that you could turn off your cameras during the presentation just to make sure we have as much bandwidth as possible. Um, also, please keep yourselves on mute for the duration of the presentation. Um, following the presentation, you're welcome to unmute and ask any questions or provide any comments that you have if you want to participate in the discussion. Uh, during the presentation, though, you are welcome to answer uh, to enter any questions that you have into the chat box, and then we will get to those at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, following the presentation, you're going to receive a brief evaluation survey. There's just a few questions. It'll take less than one minute to complete, um, but it is really valuable to us, and we really appreciate any feedback that you have to help us improve our training and resources, and as well as identifying other um, topic areas of interest. Um, finally, as you probably noticed, this presentation is being recorded, uh, so you'll receive an email in the next few days with a link to that recording and any pertinent supporting materials. Um, this recording is um, can be found on our website on our webinars page, along with many other archived presentations from UWC Tree Outreach Webinars. Um, we will share that link in the chat as well as in the follow-up email that you receive. So uh, now it's time to get to our presenter. Uh, Marlon Munt is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. He's also the Director of Health Economics at the UW Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention. Dr. Munt has published more than 100 peer-reviewed scholarly articles in a variety of multidisciplinary professional journals. His goal is to optimize tobacco treatment options in order to achieve the greatest impact within the bounds of available resources. The overall aim of his work is to find the most cost-effective ways to help people stop smoking. So we are really excited for Marlon to share some of that research and expertise with us today, and I am going to turn it over to him now. Thank you. Okay. Everything looks great. Looking good. Okay. So yes, I am a, a health economist. Um, which means I'm looking at uh, the cost and the uh, impact of uh, tobacco cessation treatment and weighing those and uh, trying to make recommendations on what is the most efficient way to help people to quit smoking. Uh, throughout my talk, uh, you're gonna see some images sprinkled from uh, the uh, Portland area. I actually presented these results uh, in Portland, and uh, and so I've got a, a number of, of things here that are from the area. This actually is Haystack Rock. Um, it's a 230 foot uh, tall sea stack in the tide pools off the Oregon coast, the third largest uh, such intertidal structure in the world, and it's also a national uh, wildlife preservation site because puffins uh, nest and lay their eggs on this monument rock. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, the economic costs of tobacco use, the, um, the impact that uh, tobacco has on people's health and on the healthcare system. We know that tobacco use is the single most preventable cause of morbidity and mortality in the US. Close to 16 million Americans suffer from smoking-related illnesses. Uh, it's associated with one out of every five deaths in the US, 
And it's estimated that the smoking related costs in the healthcare system are roughly $225 billion a year. So it is an enormous public health concern. We know that uh, there are effective tobacco cessation treatments. So uh, cessation medications have been approved um, by the FDA, the US Preventative S Services Task Force gives uh, tobacco cessation intervention, its highest grade and A grade uh, for preventive services. There are effective ways to help smokers to quit. Uh, this is Multnomah Falls uh, in the, uh, outside the Portland area, second largest or tallest year round waterfall in the US behind only Niagara Falls. So I'm gonna get a little bit of, of, of a primer about the way in which I and other health economists think about uh, this trade-off between costs and benefits of different types of treatments. So uh, policymakers, stakeholders, advocates are looking for cost benefit data to reach informed decisions about what types of care can be given at the most efficient level um, in terms of tobacco cessation treatment. And we're looking at the trade-off between costs and benefits of different approaches. So there is a point potentially at which we reach overkill where you know, we're, we're doing more than uh, is necessary to get at the, the results that we're hoping for. And so an approach that, that uh, we as health economists use is to do cost effectiveness analysis. So what we're going to do is weigh the relative costs of an intervention with the outcomes or the effects uh, of different types of approaches or different types of treatment that might be available for a particular, uh, for a particular condition. In this case, uh, cigarette smoking is what we're talking about. So what do we think about when we uh, introduce one of these cost effectiveness models? Well, basically what we wanna do is comparison analysis. So we're gonna look at what is sort of a baseline or current standard of care, and then think about how incorporating an intervention or adding something to care might change resource use and outcomes and we'll look at this from a longitudinal perspective. So we'll look not just at what's happening in the time that this treatment may be given, but we may look more long-term in terms of things like costs and outcomes for patients and for the healthcare system or healthcare providers. And as we look at the cost side, we might think about different types of costs that are, are incorporated into a, a, a typical intervention. So um, incentives is one of those potential costs. Uh, healthcare systems, um, you know, health insurers, uh, uh, HMOs often provide incentives for um, doing things that may improve health in the long-term sense. Um, and we may have interventions themselves that, uh, that include in incentives or are part of a, a larger package that may incentivize something that improves health or uh, improves long-term outcomes. We also look at resources in terms of what does it cost or what are the, the resources we need to provide a particular service. There are administrative costs if we do things like screening or, um, or providing a, 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 uh, an intervention. And then procedures and medications add to the overall picture in terms of um, the cost side of providing an intervention or healthcare um, service. 
weighing that on the, the effectiveness side, we might think about different types of outcomes that we're interested in. So if we're thinking of individuals who are using cigarettes, the most important outcome may be smoking cessation. Are they able to effectively quit smoking? But along with that comes things like improved health or improved quality of life often or impacts on healthcare utilization. So um, avoiding some high impact events like cancer or heart disease or stroke may be an outcome that is related to uh, individuals successfully stopping smoking. And so the way we develop this plan of approach is to, for example, look at um, the, the proportion of individuals who smoke who received tobacco cessation treatment in both an incentive and a control or standard of care condition. We calculate cumulative costs and cumulative probability of abstinence by study group um, based on different pathways. So an individual you know, may uptake different parts of an inter intervention that inc could include uh, counseling, it could include medications, it could include um, different approaches for medications, so nicotine replacement therapy or Vreniclin. Um, and then we need to assess some degree of confidence in those results, and often that's done with what's called Monte Carlo sim simulation. It's essentially using a, uh, a statistical technique to get an idea of if we did this many, many times over, what is a likely um, range of outcomes that we could expect to find. And there's some mathematics behind this. I'm not gonna go into this terribly deeply, but basically um, we wanna control, we, we wanna compare the cost outcomes to the effectiveness outcomes uh, for our particular treatment that we're interested in evaluating. This is the uh, International Rose Test Garden in Portland. Uh, Portland is, is known as the Rose City. And it's got a huge, enormous, very impressive uh, Rose Test Garden. Uh, so, now that we have a little bit of primer on uh, the cost effectiveness, I want to talk through um, some of the studies that we've done at CTRI uh, evaluating costs and outcomes for different types of interventions. And uh, I'm focusing here on three different studies that I call the too much, too little, and just right. The first is uh, one that maybe was a, a, an example of too much. Um, and we'll see that as we go through this. So this first study I'm gonna talk about uh, was called the Quitting Through Intensive Treatment Study or QUIT study. It was a, a study that was funded by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute at the NIH um, and conducted uh, by C CTRI from 2017 to 2020. And the idea here is that we know that there are medications, pharmacotherapies, that help people who want to quit be more successful in their quitting attempt. attempt. And varenicline is one of those. It lowers reinforcement and withdrawal symptoms during a smoking cessation attempt. And it's dem been demonstrated to be effective for helping people who want to uh, quit to be successful in that smoking cessation attempt. But the question that we were asking in this study is, is there a way to increase the effectiveness of varenicline? So maybe varenicline could be used in combination with a nicotine replacement therapy patch. So possibly that's a way to increase the uh, effectiveness in terms of helping people to stop smoking. Um, and different studies have been, have been done on this in the past that had sort of mixed results. So some of them um, said that nicotine re replacement therapy seemed to help 
in terms of increasing the effectiveness of varenicline. And others said, well, we don't see anything particularly strong. There may be something there, but it's not uh, overly clear. So the quit study was to, uh, to investigate this. Maybe there's a way to uh, improve the effectiveness of varenicline in treating uh, tobacco uh, use through cessation treatment. Uh, there's also a, there was also a question, um, is it potentially helpful to extend varenicline from a standard 12-week protocol to something longer? Um, and there have been studies that suggested that increasing the duration of uh, a varenicline treatment regimen might be helpful in terms of improving uh, cessation rates. So the, the question we had was uh, whether we, if we combine varenicline with nicotine replacement therapy patch or prolong varenicline uh, beyond the standard 12-week regimen, whether this will enhance smoking cessation and you know, from my perspective, whether this is a cost-effective uh, way to help people to stop smoking. So what is the cost effectiveness of combining varenicline with nicotine uh, patch and or extending uh, varenicline from a standard 12 week regimen up to 24 weeks? And so this study did a two by two double blind trial of 12 week varenicline or 24 week varenicline with or without nicotine replacement therapy patch. And we had four study groups. So the standard therapy was the group one, the 12 week monotherapy. And again, I, I talk about, uh, I talked about cost evaluations in my introduction here. So um, some of the things I was looking at were uh, counseling sessions. So as we add um, duration, we may be adding to the counseling that's provided. We're adding potentially to uh, prescription medication costs for varenicline or nicotine replacement therapy. If the individuals maintain um, their uh, adherence to the treatment, of course, um, and I calculated the costs based on what individuals actually use, not what they potentially could have gotten uh, from their treatment group, uh, because some people uh, stop taking the medications, and at that point, we don't want to be adding uh, costs for that particular treatment regimen if, uh, if individuals are no longer taking the medication or getting counseling. And we used as a primary endpoint, 52 week biochemically confirmed tobacco abstinence. So individuals were asked um, through survey if they were abstinent at 52 weeks. And if they said that they were, we asked them to provide a, a CO2 sample. And again, I have a, a mathematical approach that I'm using to compare costs to the outcomes in this case abstinence. And the results that we saw were that the more intensive treatments really didn't differentiate themselves from the standard varenicline monotherapy for 12 weeks. You see the abstinence rates. And these are pretty common for people who are uh, trying to quit uh, roughly 25% in each of the four groups. But of course, there are added costs if we uh, add more intensity to the treatment regimen. And so I map out what we're getting for that extra boost in terms of the treatment and the, the cost effectiveness ratio is essentially the uh, slope of this line, which is pretty good for 12-week varenicline alone, 
but you see rises very steeply when we go to adding patch and extending treatment duration from 12 to 24 weeks. And so the results here suggest that most of our groups, we didn't even get uh, an additional increase in terms of effectiveness. In that case, the, uh, the reported outcome is that standard varenicline dominates um, either 12-week varenicline plus patch or 24-week varenicline uh, alone because it ends up being as effective uh, while being less costly. And the bump that we get for uh, the most intensive treatment, 24 week and patch, um, comes out to about $94 million for one additional person who quits. And in terms of um, quality adjusted life years or a health benefit, about $92 million per additional quality adjusted life year. So statistically, um, the other treatments are virtually indistinguishable with standard 12-week varenicline, which itself is very effective and cost-effective. But, uh, but the, the economic um, cost of adding that extra uh, intensity exceeds what we generally um, take as a cost-effectiveness threshold of if we can get an additional quality adjusted life year in the fifty dollars to $100,000 range, we're considering that to be a pretty good bang for the buck. So um, what we found was that adding duration or adding patch in combination with varenicline um, was generally equivalent efficacy-wise, but not equivalent from a, a cost-effectiveness perspective. It just was not cost-effective. So you know, maybe the, the idea of increasing intensity or adding duration um, is too much. We get a very good, um, we get, get a very good results with standard varenicline, but adding uh, extra costs or, or benefits or adding extra costs or duration here um, doesn't give us much added benefit. Okay, so the second study I wanna talk about is maybe one of my examples of something that we're doing too little of. Maybe we should uh, look more closely at this and think about ways to increase the, uh, the amount that we're investing in this particular treatment. Um, this is a picture of Mount Hood, the highest point in Oregon and uh, the fourth, fourth highest uh, mountain in the Cascade Range. Uh, considered to be the volcano uh, in Oregon that's actually most likely to erupt. So the second study I want to talk about it is what we called striving to quit. This was a study that leveraged financial payments, incentives, to increase uh, treatment engagement with the, the Wisconsin Tobacco Quit Line for uh, individuals who were Medicaid enrollees. So what the, we did in this study, uh, the approach we took was to uh, enroll Medicaid recipients into the study sample. And a lot of these were reached through uh, primary care clinic referral or uh, community-based referrals um, health and human services sites uh, throughout the state or callers to the tobacco quit line. Um, and individuals who uh, agreed to be part of this study uh, were then randomized to either an incentive group or a standard of, of care approach to, uh, to helping them. They, they were all interested in uh, potentially stopping smoking, um, but some of them were in an, an incentive group that had a little extra boost 
to maybe uh, increase engagement. So the approach here was to offer tobacco quitline smoking cessation counseling calls to everyone in the study uh, once a month for five months. But individuals in the incentive group got uh, an additional payment for uh, taking the counseling calls from the Wisconsin Tobacco Quitline counselors. So they were paid uh, $30 per call for every one of the calls that they completed with the Quitline counselor. And they were given a small incentive for biochemically verified ab abstinence at a six month follow-up visit. And again, uh, you know, I look at the economics of this. So we had the costs of the incentives to, to uh, try to increase engagement with the quit line. There are service costs for the quit line itself and for, um, uh, for materials involved in, um, in contacting and enrolling uh, individuals and verifying smoking status at the end. And then um, potentially there are increased medication costs because if individuals are more engaged in their uh, cessation treatment, they might be more likely to, uh, to get a, a, a prescription for a, a cessation medication. So I, I looked specifically at um, medications for tobacco cessation treatment, um, provided by Medicaid data during the follow-up period. And the outcome here was a, a point prevalence abstinence at six month follow-up uh, verified by, again, a, a CO2 test, a biochemical uh, confirmation. And in terms of the outcomes, uh, I'm gonna show two of these, but I'll sort of go back and forth um, to let you see where the real difference is. Um, I broke down from the intervention group and the control group, how many calls individuals took based on whether they were getting incentives or not. So this is the example from the uh, intervention group of whether they took zero up to all five of the quitline calls and this is going to be the example of the control group, um, but let me go back and, and have you take a quick look, in particular at the last two items, oops, which were the four or five calls. And what you can see is that roughly 67% of individuals took four or five calls if they were in the uh, incentive group. Whereas in the control group, that was only about 38% of individuals that took four or five calls from the quitline counselor. And it turned out that success in terms of whether someone quit or not was actually fairly similar if they took the same number of calls. So a person taking five calls in the incentive group was roughly um, equally likely to quit as someone taking five calls from the quitline counselor in the control group. The big difference was that people in the incentive group simply took more calls from the counselors. And that is what we were hoping to see is that we could move individuals sort of up the, the uh, path here towards more calls if they were given incentives. And so what we found was that overall, uh, roughly 22% of the incentive group participants had quit smoking at six month follow-up compared to about 14% of the control group for a differential, an increase in the effectiveness of roughly 8%. So that's a nice increase um, based on an incentive to 
uh, most of the incentive was to engage with the quitline counselors. And so the uh, end result was that uh, the differential cost was about $183 more for the incentive group compared to the control group. And that comes out to a, a cost effectiveness of $2,316 per additional uh, individual who quit smoking or roughly $3,000 per quality adjusted life year. That, uh, uh, remember um, when I was talking about the uh, intensive Renekin study, we're looking for quality adjusted life year um, cost effectiveness of something less than fifty to hundred thousand dollars per quality, and here at three thousand dollars per quality, basically says that most healthcare systems would be willing to spend ten times as much as we spend here and still consider this an effective treatment outcome um, in terms of weighing costs and benefits. And I also did some other work uh, looking at maybe there's a way that we can get slightly better cost effectiveness if we um, changed the, the uh, payment structure. And I found out that, that there may be a, a way to, uh, to improve this slightly by giving um, slightly lower costs on the first four calls and increasing the incentive on the fifth payment. So that, that's what this uh, chart um, lays out is that uh, we can get slightly better uh, cost effectiveness at maybe $20 per uh, incentive payment to take calls through the first four and then balancing that out with a higher um, incentive at the final uh, call to complete the entire uh, treatment regimen. So there may be even better ways to, uh, to use incentives to help to, to uh, get people to engage and with engagement to get people to, uh, to be more successful in their stop smoking attempts. So the, the takeaway here is uh, that maybe incentives are uh, an underutilized resource in helping uh, patients who smoke to be successful in their attempts to quit. All right. Uh, and the third study that I want to talk about was called the Comprehensive Tobacco Intervention Program, or CTIP. Uh, this picture here is actually the, uh, the Japanese uh, garden in Portland, which is considered to be the most authentic Japanese garden uh, outside of Japan. Uh, it's a, a very tranquil, uh, beautiful garden uh, in Portland itself. So this third study was funded by the National Cancer Institute. And the idea here was to uh, increase smoking cessation outreach and support to patients who smoked to hopefully get them to engage in a, a smoking cessation attempt. And if they engaged in an attempt to be more successful in quitting smoking. So this was a study that the Center for Tobacco Research Intervention uh, did from 2017 to 2021. The idea here is that in primary care, we really have a unique opportunity to deliver that chronic illness care approach to patient, patients who smoke. So the, the, the principle of a, a chronic illness care management approach is that it often takes more than one attempt to be successful. And family practitioners can provide that repeated 
um, evidence-based approach to get individuals uh, to consider smoking and maybe to try. Um, and if they try to maybe be su more successful um, in a, a smoking cessation attempt. Uh, but that might be something that, you know, requires multiple attempts or multiple um, multiple interventions from the, the family uh, care practitioner. So how uh, did we envision this uh, increase in engagement and hopefully successful um, quitting? Well, we went to the electronic health record um, for when individuals were there seeing their primary care physician and added some prompts and tools for the clinician um, to offer tobacco treatment at routine clinical uh, uh, care encounters. Um, so there was a prompt uh, if the individual indicated that, that they were smoking to ask about whether they were ready to make a quit attempt and um, how the family physician could be um, uh, an additional resource to help if they were ready to make that quit attempt. The tobacco system also um, hired certified tobacco treatment specialists and integrated them uh, into the primary care approach by providing uh, outreach and cessation support for individuals who are ready to quit smoking. So if someone um, indicated to their primary care physician or clinician that they were ready to quit, then uh, they would be referred to the treatment specialist um, who would give them additional support and resources. Uh, and then there were also some approaches that um, were more sort of outreach or cold call type approaches, um, quarterly mailings, outreach, uh, sample nicotine replacement therapy patches to uh, patients who are on the smoking registry uh, in the healthcare system to hopefully get individuals to at least consider a smoking cessation attempt if they hadn't already um, thought about it. And so the research question is, what is the cost effectiveness of this comprehensive approach to uh, tobacco treatment? The way that this was uh, conducted was that uh, clinics were uh, sort of rolled into an active um, treatment approach at different time points. And then we compared uh, their, their baseline or their control condition prior to being active to what their results were after they were actively involved in the comprehensive uh, treatment intervention. And we looked at, you know, what are the resources we have to put into this approach? Well, we need to hire and, and um, support the, the tobacco treatment specialists. Uh, we need to, to cover the cost of the outreach, the sample nicotine re re replacement therapy patches. Um, we need to consider from the, the clinician side uh, whether they have increased time and investment in terms of, of counseling and screening. Uh, and if individuals uh, get prescribed a medication, uh, we need to consider the costs of those additional medications that may be prescribed. And here um, we had a couple of of outreaches or a, a, a couple of, of outcomes that we were particularly interested in. Uh, how much reach did we get? Uh, you know, how much contact did we get um, through the, the tobacco treatment specialists or through uh, physician visit contact? And in terms of effectiveness, um, what we looked at was the electronic health record reporting of whether someone was listed as a current smoker. Um, so current smoking status uh, 
converted to former smoking status uh, was an indication that we were, had maybe um, effectively helped someone to stop smoking. And one other piece that uh, I incorporated into this particular study was to look at potential cost offsets. So um, we know that, uh, that cigarette use has an impact on lots of healthcare system, uh, lots of healthcare uh, or health systems in the body, um, you know, lungs, heart, blood, uh, um, you know, may have an impact on diabetes and other types of, of, um, of things that uh, involve uh, patient care. And so I wanted to look at um, comparing urgent care and uh, acute care events for individuals on the smoking registry uh, pre and post implementation to get a sense of maybe we are effectively uh, improving the health of populations and reducing that uh, likelihood of an acute care event. So what did we find in terms of outcomes? Well, our tobacco treatment specialists were successful in uh, having contact with roughly 50% of the individuals on our smoking uh, registry at the clinics. They, there was an increase in documented counseling or uh, medications for a smoking cessation attempt from roughly 10% in the pre-intervention period to 24% in the post-intervention period. So about 14% more um, counseling or medications and uh, documented uh, electronic health record smoking cessation. So that change from current smoking status to former smoking status, we noted in 9% of post intervention patients compared to 1% making that switch in the pre-intervention period. So again, an 8% increase in the effectiveness of uh, individuals being able to successfully quit smoking. And here, the uh, cost effectiveness ratios are very, very positive looking. So we found that the investments we made um, led to roughly $628 per additional patient who quit smoking or $905 per additional quality adjusted like year gained. That type of cost effectiveness is well above, above and beyond virtually anything else that a healthcare system does to improve patient health and longevity. Um, as I said, uh, you know, if we can you know, get an additional, an additional quality to adjust, adjusted life year for fifty to $100,000, we're in, in general in the healthcare system satisfied with that as a result. And here we're getting you know, that type of health outcome um, for a fraction of, of that uh, typical threshold that we need to consider it cost-effective. So traditional cost-effectiveness uh, thresholds are in the $50 to $100,000 range. At $905 per quality, this indicates something that is highly effective uh, at improving health uh, in our patients. And as I mentioned, I also um, took a look at acute care costs for the patients. And what we see is that there isn't much change in terms of acute care costs for patients on the smoking registry until all of the clinics have successfully been uh, introduced and switched over to active clinics. Uh, January 2019 was the point at which all of the clinics were active. And at that point, we started to see a trend towards a decrease in acute care costs. So um, not just uh, a, a, a high
highly cost effective in terms of getting individuals to quit, but there may be for the healthcare system benefits in terms of uh, reduced acute care events as well. And so in my comparison, um, the average monthly acute care costs for an individual in the smoking registry was $432 per patient per month prior to uh, the clinic itself becoming an active intervention clinic. And that average cost went down to $390 per patient per month, um, a cost differential of $42 per patient per month. Now, I have to qualify this um, and say that, you know, there's still a, a great deal of variability there. If we look at um, the things in the parentheses, the, the uh, confidence intervals, um, it's not strong enough to say that definitively there would be a, a, a cost decrease for the intervention patients, but it's encouraging. Um, so more, more evidence is needed or longer follow-up to, uh, to see if that trend bears out over a longer period of time. So the takeaway here is maybe this is one of those interventions that's a just right. Um, it really is, uh, in this case, a, a cost-effective approach that was conducted in, in real-world primary care clinics. So this was you know, very much um, done in a way that that the clinics and the healthcare system themselves um, potentially would have approached it uh, without this being any type of research study whatsoever. So uh, we were very encouraged by uh, a comprehensive approach to uh, help individuals to engage and to be successful in stop smoking attempts. Okay, I am gonna wrap up there and take questions or comments. I'm still on mute. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Um, a lot of really good information to help us understand um, what is cost effective in treating tobacco use and dependence and to figure out what might be most impactful. Um, I'm definitely will open it up for questions if people want to come off of mute or continue to answer those enter those questions in the chat box. Um, I do have a question about the um, middle section on incentives. Um, just curious if you have any thoughts on it sounds like the longer the incentives contributed to increased participation in the phone calls, um, but I'm curious if early on you had any assessment in terms of motivational readiness at the time of entering. Was right. there any increase in motivation over time or were all individuals um, ready and prepared to quit at the time of entering the study at the first call? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. You know, so uh, part of the intake, I mean, all of the individuals who were part of the study um, had to uh, had to indicate and and uh, a willingness to try to quit smoking. So um, mm -hmm. they they were all individuals who were current smokers and uh, who had indicated that they would like to make a, a quit smoking attempt. We measured um, at the beginning their um, their motivation and their 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 confidence in being able to, to quit smoking, um, and it was I mean it, it was relatively high. It wasn't you know not everyone was was completely confident or or completely you know sort of on board with yeah they're going to be able to do this they're going to be successful but um, but generally speaking um, most of the individuals. Were, were relatively confident and there wasn't a, a, anything that could differentiate between the incentive group and the control group. So um, there wasn't something that said, oh yeah, okay, pe people that you know, are really confident they're gonna be able to quit, um, if we give them a, a little extra boost or incentive, um, mm -hmm. it's gonna get them you know, sort of over the hump in terms of being successful. Uh, it really was more of a, a sort of a, 
global increase in that um, in that willingness to engage with the the quitline counselors um, mm -hmm. that you know was not differentiated based on what people thought going into the trial about um, whether they thought they would be successful or whether they were really motivated um, to stop smoking at that time. So, uh, you know, I looked at, you know, sort of subgroups and, and different ways to, uh, to evaluate whether certain individuals might be more successful with incentives than others, but there wasn't anything that really distinguished um, mm -hmm. those that, that ended up being more successful or taking more, more uh, calls from the counselors. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I have another question in the chat. How did you determine the incentive amount and was there a minimum amount that you found effective? Right. So this was a, a research study. So there, there had to be a certain... Um, there had, there had to be a certain cautiousness in terms of how much incentive could be offered. Um, one of the things that we're concerned about when we do research studies is that if you give a really big incentive, you may be um, overly biasing, you know, people to stay in the study or not stay in the study. Um, you know, it has, to, there, there's a, a certain, um, balancing that has to be uh, worked out. Um, and in this case, you know, we had to work out with the, the Medicaid program itself, you know, what they thought was reasonable. We had to work out from the, the funders at, at uh, DHS, the, the Wisconsin Department uh, of, of Health and Human Services, um, what they thought was reasonable. And we came out with the, the $30 per call um, for five calls or $150 maximum. Now that um, seems like it, it's a pretty reasonable ballpark figure. I mean, if you look at what HMOs or other healthcare systems tend to offer for uh, health improving engagement, you know, exercise or, or whatever, um, you know, 100 to 200 dollars is is a is a pretty uh, pretty typical amount. So I thought that 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 was a pretty reasonable approach. Um, as I said, it, it, there may be um, it may be just as effective with slightly lower um, incentive amounts, um, but my results suggested at least that some sort of added bonus to get everyone to that fifth call um, was a good idea. But that's a, that's a great question. You know, how, how, do, you, how do you decide? Um, and and uh, in this case, you know, weighing the costs and the benefits, it seemed like um, right in, in around that $30 per uh, incentive value for individuals to engage with the quit line was was a really nice um, sort of middle point. Yeah, we'll be curious to see if you do additional research to figure out if more or less is changes that impact, but it sounds like $30 seems to be pretty on par with where we what we see elsewhere. So right. awesome. Um, are there any other questions? Did anyone want to come off mute and ask their question directly? I'll just pause for a few seconds to let that opportunity happen. And if not, um, we want to give one more big thank you to Marlon for this excellent presentation. Uh, reminder that you will receive a follow-up email uh, with a recording of today's presentation, and that can also be found on our UWC Tree website, along with a number of other uh, archived, archived webinars. Um, and with that, I will say thank you so much for attending today. We hope to connect with you all in the future soon. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.